And on April 11, 2024, the government of St. Martin Curacao and the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin signed the outline agreement resolution Enya, of which a version was shared with the Parliament earlier today. Having said all that before, today I will provide Parliament with a recap of the structure and the financials of the re resolution. With the resolution of Enya, the future for the vulnerable 30,000 policyholders whose pensions are worth threatening to be significantly cut will be secured. Such a cut would have se severe social and economic consequences for Curacao, but also for St. Martin. So for the policyholders, it's a very good development. Basically, the resolution fund is, is found in the following solution, which is called a partial restart. First, a split is made of the life insurance portfolio between Enya Life and Li Enya Life New. One, the rights and obligations accruing from premiums paid before Enya was placed under the emergency regulation on July 4, 2018, belong to Enya Life Old, and the rights and obligations accruing from premiums paid, including interest, since July 4, 2018, belong to Enya Life New. After the split of Enya Life, and your life all will be part of a control runoff scenario, which will stay under the emergency. And your life new, together with, with the other healthy parts of Enya, being Enya Schade and Enya Zorg, will be restarted as a new legal entity and competitive insurer, fully capitalized, reorganized, and fully licensed. The Enya Carib Life old together with Enya Carib Holding and Enya Carib Investments will still under the emergency regulation and will be financed by a resolution fund. The healthy parts of Enya will fall under a new management foundation which foundation will have all the shares. The financial resolution. Based on the financial rights and obligations accruing from the premium, premiums paid by the policyholders residing in St. Martin and Curacao, C. Martin's share in the resolution is 6.49%, and Curacao's share is in the resolution is 93.51%. To finance the resolution fund, Curacao will continue as of, will contribute as of 2027 for 30 years, yearly an amount of 30 million guilders, and C. Martin will contribute as of 2027 for 30 years, yearly an amount of 2.08 million guilders. These amounts relate to the 93.51% shares and the 6.49%. On top of the contributions of both countries, the central bank will contribute as of 2025 for a period of 50 years, yearly an amount of 50 million guilders to the residential fund. To make it possible for the central bank to contribute for 50 years, yearly an amount of 50 million guilders as part of its gold reserves will be converted into interest generating long-term bonds. The, the income from those bonds will guarantee an annual distribution of dividends by the central bank in the amount of 18.03 million guilders, of which 50 million will be transferred to the resolution fund and 3.03 to St. Martin. <coughs> so for St. Martin, this means a total contribution of 30 years times 2.08, which is a total of 62.4 million guilders, while the dividend payout over the 50 over the coming 50 years is estimated to be 50 times the 3.03, which is 151.5 million guilders. In addition, the central bank will provide a bond loan to the resolution fund to enable a capital injection into Enya New, for which the resolution fund will obtain the certificates of shares in Enya New from the management fund foundation and a bond loan to the, re to the resolution fund to facilitate a peak facility to pre-finance any deficit in the, in the contributions in particular, in any particular year. Both bonds will be covered by a guarantee issued by the countries. All the mentioned financial streams are captured in the term sheet as I provide to Parliament in Annex C. The first three term sheets pertain to the contributions from Curacao, Samarita, and Central Bank to the Resolution Fund. Basically, the contributions are subordinated loans. Curacao will contribute as of March 15, 2027, yearly to 30 million guilders for, for, for a period of 30 years, as was mentioned. St. Martin will contribute as of March 15, 2027, the 2.082 million guilders for a period of 30 years. Central Bank will contribute as of September 1, 2025, yearly 50 million guilders for a period of 50 years. 
The fourth term sheet pertains to the peak facility. This is an overdraft, overdraft facility created for a period of 50 years. In the event that did, but between September 1st, 2024 and September 1st, 2074, it turns out that the annual contributions of the parties to the fund are insufficient to meet the deficit in a particular year. In that, in that case, the resident fund can float a bond for the central bank to subscribe based on Article 10, third paragraph, subparagraphs D and E of the central bank charter. The central bank is authorized to subscribe to a bond as soon as there's insufficient collateral to cover the subscription. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sufficient collateral. For this reason, guarantee clauses taken up in the term sheet, taking the ratio of the ownership from Curacao and St. Martin into account, and the situation that it, if one of the countries is in default, the other country does not have to guarantee that part. The fifth term sheet pertains to the transfer of the money from the resolution fund to part of Enya concerning the runoff. Basically, the, year, the yearly contributions received from Curacao and St. Martin and the Central Bank are transferred by the resolution fund to Enya Old. These are subordinated loans. The sixth term sheet pertains to a capital injection of 55 million guilders for the restart part of Enya New. For this resolution fund, will float a 30-year bond for the Central Bank to subscribe. The resolution fund will re receive certificates of shares in Enya New. As stated before, the Central Bank is authorized to subscribe to a bond based on Article 10, third paragraph, subparagraphs D and E of the Central Bank Charter. The central bank, as soon as there's sufficient collateral to cover the subscription, for this reason, for this reason, guarantee clauses taken up in this term sheet. Now go on to approvals. CFT, by its advice of January 24th, 2024, the Board of the Financial Supervision, the CFT, advised the Kingdom Council of Ministers stated to find the proposed resolution acceptable. Bezaka, on March 22, 2024, in a press briefing, the State Secretary of the Interior and Kingdom Relations qualified the proposed resolution for Enya to be financially, to be financially solid and sustainable, which will mean that once the countries adopt the proposed resolution, the refinancing of the 316.4 million guilders can be agreed on against favorable conditions like for long term against low interest rates. Life's twists, turns, and defining moments. RBC is a man for all of you. SFP. Your social and health insurance is SFP. SFP. Your social and health insurance is. Are you SFP insured? Do you have a valid medical insurance status? SSV is cardless. Request your My SSV account today and enter the virtual office of SSV. Go to SSV.sx and sign up now. SSV, yeah, yeah. your social and health insurance. Three thousand people are on the Enya pension plan. The lack of transparency in this deal 
is what bothers me. You got to understand the deal is to start three years from now. So it's not going to affect budget 2024, not 25, not 26. It affects budget 2027. That's basically also when the NRPB is wrapping up all its projects. If they are going hand in hand, I don't know. If it's a, if something that the Dutch government tell them we got to do it, so I, I, I don't know. Because there's no transparency whatsoever. But what is very clear though is the cost. 115 million guilders for 50 years. 2.3 million guilders per year. That's crystal clear. What is not clear is why. Why this deal? Because I can recall last year with the state secretary ramming down St. Martin Stroud and our minister I panicked, he signed right away. But Curacao said, absolutely not. We are not taking no six, seven hundred million dollar loan to bail out India. We are not going to do that. And out of that came a discussion and this is another option that rolled out. Curacao puts 30 million a year out of their tax money available, up to 1.5 billion to safeguard about 25 to 27,000 policyholders that live in Curacao. Now, I understand this and I support finding a solution. But what was the urgency that if by December, Enya did not have an injection of six to 700 million, the pensions would be slashed. We are in April for God's sakes. And now it was signed. So what happened from January to April? Who covered that debt? You see, the transparency is what's lacking. The stories are being told. But the question I always have is, a good story normally ain't true. When you hear the Prime Minister talk about a great day for St. Martin. Great day how? When you are an old woman at 90 years old, you're still paying back for this loan. Those people are dead and gone in their pensions. And we still paying back for this loan. Because that's what we committed ourselves to. To pay back up until 2077. My grandchildren will be 57 near in pension at 65. And we still paying back this loan. So... I need to understand why we would do this to the country. But again, there's more that bothered me. Because when you read the article that was published in the Daily Herald, the internet edition on the 12th of April, you also realize that they are talking about all the successful parts in India are going to be placed in a new to be established entity and the problematic branch of the insurance in your leave for the pension that will receive financial backing from both countries now I, I need to understand because it said with a modest contribution and dividend also from the CB from the central bank so what's the modest contribution a million two million what what is it exactly their losses last year or the year before were 45 million. That seems to have been modest too. So what is their injection actually? What is this costing the country in total? See, these are the things that you don't hear anything. And I agree with your shoes. And that's why I'm talking about it. I would not have talked about this in your deal if we understood what it meant for country St. Martin. But we don't. Oh, it's a great day. It's not a damn great day if you don't know what's coming. Because the commitment was made. But the basis for the commitment is not clear. And listen to this joke. So we pass it, we sign it. And this afternoon, 2.30, we're going to Parliament to explain it. And Parliament sat on it. Bam, bam. As if this is normal. This is a joke. This is a complete joke. A mockery. 
Can't even get your government in order. You know, I don't want to be critical on everything. But my God, man, 115 million Gilda deal is made and signed off by a government that's on its way out. Should have been out already. But true games that we will discuss just now is still sitting there and now says it's a great day for Samaritan. It's not. It honestly, it ain't. Because we build in a new company, we're going to put that company in Samaritan or are we putting it in Curacao? Where are we putting it? Because I'll tell you this much. Curacao said, listen, we pay 30 million, eh? no problem. Because the social premiums from those 25 to 27,000 people that is coming back to, Mac, to Curacao is about 16.6 .6 million. So in reality, all we really pumping in is 13.4. Because had Enya gone belly up, they wouldn't have been getting back that money either. So what is it for Samaritan then? We got 3,000. So how much money are we getting back? If I just do mathematics, I say, okay, 27,000, 3,000. That's one, one tenth, nine tenth. So if nine tenth is about 16 million, how much is one tenth? Is it about one point something million too? And that means from the 2.3 million in reality, we're getting back one and a half million in, 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 in pension, in, in premiums. What is it? Explain the people for God's sakes, man. Don't have people guessing and making up stories because that's what happens when you don't have the facts and figures. months of intense negotiations and discussions among local authorities, stakeholders, and marina operators, an agreement has finally been reached. The sign-in of the Delegation of Public Service, DSP, marks a new era of cooperation and development for this iconic location in Saint-Martin. This moment not only signifies the end of a conflict that has weighed on the marina and the local economy, but also the beginning of a period of stability and growth for the Port La Royale Marina in Marigold. The transactional agreement was signed on Wednesday, April 10, 2024, in front of the local press by the three signatories of the Memorandum of Understanding, President Louis Mussenton on behalf of the Collectivité, CEO Alan Richardson on behalf of Simpson Mar and its subsidy Samagas, as well as the Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Port of Gallus Bay, Mr. Arnel Daniel. This morning we got together with the Simpson Mar and the Port Authorities to sign a, a protocol, uh, an agreement to put an end to the conflict that existed between uh, the Simpson Mar and the, and the collectivity over the management of the marina. Uh, at Paula Royal. As a matter of fact, it's, in my opinion, it's a conflict that should not have existed, given the fact that the collectivity is a, is a majority shareholder in the same summer. So there should have been ways and means of solving, resolving this issue long time ago, and before it got to the point to which it, it have gotten. Uh, however, we see it fit. When we got into office to bring it to an end, we got the board lawyers from the collectivity and from the same summer to sit and reach uh, an agreement. Today it is done, and that's why we, we gather this morning to sign uh, the, 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 the protocol, putting an end to it, and now paving the way for a new uh, development project for the, for the marina. And what is interesting to note or to make clear is that not only is it going to be relevant to the, the marina, part of, um, marina in, in the port of Provence, no, and marina, well, why are, but the marina over here as well, which means the same marina for Louis. So there will be one management 
uh, in the future where both marinas would be uh, taken into account and with a clear strategy, a uh, model of development that will guarantee certain form of, a form of prosperity and economic development. That is the hope, that's the dream that we are entertaining because it is necessary, especially when you look into, take into account what the marina um, Paula Wild used to produce in terms of activity uh, in the Marigot area. So we want to rebuild or bring back that form of that style of economic development that was very prosperous. I believe and I'm sure that it will be comforted when you look at the figures from the past and what I'm saying. So we are pushing in that direction. So right now there's a, a, a reflection that is engaged with various potential people that sit around the table on numerous occasions and they have a deadline to produce a report to me and from which I would decide on how we're going back. We're going about a clear plan of action for the general operation of both marinas. SV insured? Do you have a valid medical insurance status? SV is cardless. Request your My SV account today and enter the virtual office of SV. Go to SV.SX and sign up now. SV, yeah. your social health insurance. Life's twists, turns, and defining moments. RBC is a plan for all of you. June 10, that's the date for the hearing, which will determine whether a retrial should be ordered in the matter involving Entertainer Vibes Cartel and his co accused. Sean, Sean Storm Campbell, Kahira Jones, and Andre Madsu St. John. The order was handed down today by Justice Marva MacDonald Bishop. The hearing is expected to last five days. The defense attorneys are to file and serve submissions on or before May 6, while the prosecution is to file its arguments on or before May 31. Sean, Sean Storm Campbell's attorney, Bert Samuels, says he is encouraged by the fact that the hearing has been scheduled weeks after the Privy Council's ruling. It's a very swift move by the court and we feel that this matter is of such great public importance that the sooner the Court of Appeal sits and determines whether there should be a retrial, the better. Last month, the Privy Council dismissed the murder conviction of Cartel, whose given name is Adija Palmer, and his co-accused on the grounds of jury tampering. Their case was also sent back to the Court of Appeal for a decision on whether they should face retrial for the 2011 murder of Clive Lizard Williams. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. Toronto woman vacationing in Jamaica is dead after being injured in an alleged assault. Crime specialist Catherine McDonald spoke to the family of Jada Whitehead, who are looking for answers and anxious to get her body home. 
She's been in Jamaica for two weeks. She went there to celebrate her wedding anniversary with her spouse, who is a resident and native of Jamaica. According to family, Jada Pauline Whitehead was excited to travel to Jamaica earlier this month. But on Saturday, the 28-year-old tragically died from injuries believed to be related to an assault while staying with her husband in Clarendon, Jamaica. She was just a free spirit, very, very beautiful person and very giving. So, like, I guess we're all in shock. The Jamaica Constabulary tells Global News in an email, reports made to the police indicated that Ms. Whitehead was involved in a domestic dispute with her husband, who she was visiting. She reportedly sustained injuries, but she did not attend the doctor nor reported the matter to police. The next day, Whitehead was found unresponsive in bed and was taken to hospital where she was pronounced dead. More difficult to grasp because we can't even go say our last goodbyes. Police tell Global News the husband has been taken into custody and he is likely to be charged with murder. The family says they're anxious for answers and to bring Whitehead's body home. It's very difficult to kind of make plans and try to get her back here um, and ensure that the investigation is going to be done properly. Whitehead worked at Ossington Old Orchard Junior Public School. The Toronto District School Board sent a letter home to parents and students Monday, advising them of the death of Whitehead, who worked as a caretaker, described as a valued member of the school for the last two years. We reached out to Global Affairs Canada, but have yet to hear back. Catherine McDonald, Global News.